So we're going to pray, and I can I get to get my mind right. So, all right, let's pray. So, Father, we thank you for uh, this day. Thank you for helping with the technology issues and fixing these things and continue to give me patience and understanding and just your, the calmness of what you have in store to fix things and your timing and your way. Thank you for all the um, opportunities to help from Mariah to Philip online. And I think it's all repaired for us. So I'll ask us, uh, we ask now that you be with us and help us uh, to just be able to see and understand and know um, things from your word to have it be refreshed and, and reinvigorated in our minds, hearts, soul, and spirit, and just continue to remind us of your sustaining grace, on ongoing love and support you always give to us and helping us to be uh, encouraged by you, uh, taught understanding of their, your truth and your scripture. Help us to understand again as we look now as your, our counselor, our teacher, our guide, and our shepherd, and our pastor. And our, we ask this all in, in your name, in Jesus, Yeshua's name, amen. All right, so if you guys are online, you can hear and see me now. Um, it was an internal issue. It wasn't our internet. It wasn't our computer. It wasn't our hardware. It was Mega Meetings back end site had updated, and I went through the conversation. You probably could hear me. And Mariah's trying to help me, by the way. If you guys are wondering, Mariah from Sunday's here tonight. They were asking. They kind of saw you at a glimpse from the camera. They go, "Who's that?" So, yeah, so, so that's Mariah from uh, from Sunday. So, um, so it turns out if you heard me on the phone with with the guy, um, he was saying, you know, he. So it was they updated a system issue, and it it wasn't updated for the microphone so ours wasn't communicating with them so now you had a driver on their end so, yeah like, something yeah, like that because i yeah. looked at that yeah. i was like okay the internet says the yeah. driver but he probably already checked it. yeah and you think uh, our end the yeah driver on their end. exactly our end was all working <laughs> fine 100 percent our end was off i did all that on our end just to make sure though mm -hmm. um which thank god i did that because maybe if i didn't it would have been a problem who knows <laughs> so yeah so anyways it's all good now um so we're not going to go as long tonight because of the fiasco, <laughs> but we're going to go about an hour. Uh, I think that's probably the good because I'll tell you one thing, that was kind of stressful and draining for me. I, I don't know about you, but uh, so, and everybody can still hear me and see me online. And if you cannot, then you got to refresh or you, you can't. If anybody else can tell them, they can't hear me, obviously. <laughs> but let them know to refresh their browser. If anybody who's not hearing me, please help each other online to let people know to refresh their browser or at worst case, sign out, sign back in, and that, that should fix the issue because of the old connection was not right. That's the problem. All right, so with that being said, we're going to go over the conclusion or the recap and summary of Second Thessalonians chapter 3. I know you, probably, you might have a lot of questions yourself, Mariah, because you were here from last time. There was a lot of stuff I covered a lot, I know, right? I from did Sunday. have a question. Sure. It's, it's Bible-related but unrelated to last week. Um, what is the best way to overcome spiritual warfare um, if you're getting attacked because you left paganism and you joined the church? <laughs> wow, that's yeah, a, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, yeah. It, it happened real fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, if you can hear the question that Mariah asked, and, and it's, it kind of ties into what we're talking about because people in Thessalonica were dealing with leaving paganism and, and going to uh, not just the belief in Christ, but a depth of it and just about a six month period of time. They went from knowing nothing to now having this graduated depth understanding. And and so with the bottom line that he was, it's a good question, it's actually right in line what we're talking about, believe it or not. And so the question is is that what Paul, what Paul said is that we should, a couple things. One, uh, in their case, there was a different message being given them. You don't have that message yet. You don't know all that yet. But so that part won't apply as far as in um, him kind of refreshing back to what he's taught them. But the principle of how they're supposed to live is the issue. Yeah, is everything okay? Uh, I just need help getting the screen now. Sorry, something else is going on. What do you mean? What do you mean? I just need to get the... This? Yes. You can't, it won't go any further down. That's as far as it goes. So then I need to see you. What do you mean? You did, babe, you just do this. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's your camera. Okay, thank you. You're thinking of the camera. It's the camera. It's just the camera. So, uh, so the reality is that on what he was talking about to people in Thessalonica was that in, in the first epistle, and he kind of builds on this, which I actually mentioned uh, on the board. I'll, I'll get it to it in a minute. But the answer to your question is, it's not easy. It never is. But the, the couple, three points are, I've used a lot of points, but the main three ones that I can recall off the top of my head is that number one, easier said than done, <laughs> but don't let the, he calls persecutions and afflictions 
That's what he labels them as. And afflictions are the things that are painfully trials to your life, whether that's physical, mental, psychological, all of that. Then there's also the persecutions are when they are pursuing. The word persecute has the word pursuing in it. So people are pursuing you just to harass you, right? So there's a pursuing of someone harassing you in many different ways. And there's people that are afflicting you, causing you pain. So what he's saying is you got to remember that that's part of the passage of maturity in your faith. So take what they're doing as wicked and, and, and remember that God's using that for good to buffet you. It's like an exercise type regimen. The pain of exercise, if the muscles don't have pain, it means you're not growing. So if you don't have any spiritual conflict, it means you're not growing in that sense. So one, perspective, change that perspective and see the affliction and persecution as benefit to your challenging of your faith, like ironing, sharpening iron. And secondly, he talks about how uh, you know we need to make sure that we just don't focus on them as much as we focus on our walk. And that is in reference to how Paul was saying how he mentioned the word sterizai. And he means, it means to, to ongoingly be established and be made firm. So I actually wrote that on the board here um, somewhere. <laughs> Where did I write that at? I know I wrote it on the board. I know I did. Right here. Establish, make firm, sterizai. So it's a Greek word uh, that means, and I, I've mentioned it on Sunday, but it means to have uh, like, a, like, a, like a, the image, like a, a, a beam in the ground. You dug a hole and you put the beam in the ground, but the beam's not 100%, it's still a little wobbly. So you gotta put the dirt in, put the concrete in, then it's really firm. So what he's saying is, is that when, when people try to, like you're the beam, and they're trying to constantly push you, and you're like, you know, because you're not firmed up yet in your faith. He said, instead of trying to worry about hitting back or, or getting frustrated and thinking about what they're doing, just firm yourself up in your faith. So the one thing is, remember, per, the perspective is one thing. See the persecutions and afflictions as, as venues of conflict to strengthen your faith. Secondly, look at your own, what you need to do on your side of the fence, if you will, uh, about walking with God and just talking with God in prayer and, and being with, just pour your heart out, you know, and just um, and, and spend time reading what the scripture uh, has to say to you, wherever God leads you and how you want to, whatever book you want to read. Um, but the third thing is just remember also that he says in Second Thessalonians, he told these pagan people that came from that side, he said not to get in Second Thessalonians. He kind of ups the ante, and he says, "You know what? You're going to get vindication one day. You, you all do realize that, right? There's vindication. Like there's going to be these people that have done all these harms to you. They're going to get what's coming to them. That's what he says in the first chapter, basically. He says, "Don't don't forget. Everybody has what's coming to them. Everybody. So perspective is one thing. Uh, again, focusing on strengthening your faith is another thing. And then thirdly, remembering." That wherever you end up on the other side of this, in Christ is one thing, but where you end up in Christ, as far as in your in intimacy or deeper relationship with Him, that's going to be what you put into it. You're going to get out of it what you put into it. So don't let somebody else steal from you the, the right perspective of faith, hope, and love. Don't let somebody take from you the, the fact that they're using it for evil. You have God use it for good for you. And then thirdly, remember that no matter what they do or you do, we all are individually accountable to our end result of the judgment before Christ. And so that's what he's focusing on on the, the second epistle. He starts off with that issue about they're going to face their judgment and it's not going to be pretty. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but uh, we didn't get involved in it on Sunday. I kind of, I, I mentioned it. So many things I talked about. But in the first chapter of Second Thessalonians, Paul talks about it. He mentions there is destructions, plural, and he calls it, um, in the Greek, it's called holothros and apaleia. And it means that holothros is like the initial destruction because of what you've done in your sins. And this is people in Christ. It's really scary. So people in Christ who believe in Jesus, who get involved in nefarious things, that <laughs> that's why scripture says, better to not have known him than to know him, Second Peter, than to go back like a pig to the mire or a dog to the vomit. You, you're, you better not to even have known him than to know God, the accountability goes way through the roof because now you're made alive in spirit. So now you, you should know at least a minimum that you're accountable to a holy God who created you. A lot of folks don't even know that because you may be made aware of that and you know that that God is Jesus. That, that, that ups the ante quite a bit. And now he says, well, now you're, you're accountable to a high level. And so in first chapter of Second Thessalonians, he mentions holothros destruction as the initial destruction someone has. Then he mentions Apollo destruction as their ultimate destruction they're going to have afterwards. So for example, it's like saying, oh, I... I, uh, someone took the life of someone I love. Ooh. Well, that's murder, and then they go to prison for that. That's their holothros destruction. 
they get their initial consequence of pain, suffering, and anguish now for what they've done. But it doesn't end there. It gets a lot worse in the Apollea destruction, which means that now they face God, if you will, but then it gets worse. It gets more permanent in their consequence if they haven't made right, if they didn't you know, repent and all that kind of thing. So we're assuming they double down on their, on their heinous act. So with that particular thing, in the next life, it's interesting because both of those things happen in similitude and like a holothros would be now and Apollea later. But in the next life, they're actually pictured by two different types of destruction, one that's temporary and one that lasts, one that's temporary with a chance for a reprieve, like the person who would go to prison has a chance to be repenting. But once the gavel's been down that you're on death row, you're done. You're not going to, you can't stop that, you know. You, so, well, presidential pardon, I guess. But the reality is, for all intents and purposes, the holothros is for the thousand-year reign of Christ. When people get a chance, like Jonah, when he was in the belly of the whale, a uh, great fish, he was given a chance in chapter 2 of Jonah. He actually was dead, and his solical body was speaking to God, and he was brought back to life again. And then that's why Jesus said, as Jonah was in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights, so shall I be, a son of man. And people don't understand what he meant, but clearly Jonah died because he said, no, he didn't. You know he had to die, or else Jesus is lying, because he died on the cross. So they both physically died. People don't put that together. They go, oh, no, he didn't die because he was talking. Jesus also was going, he went, he went down to Hades and he was also talking to spirits in prison, it says in 1 Peter. But he was dead on the cross in his body, physical body, his solical body. He has three bodies. You have a spiritual body, a solical body, and a physical body. And so the physical body of Jonah died, and so he was down in the Hades. And he talks about fire and billows of waves. And so these are punishment depictions of what happens. And so, but he was, he repented and he was restored, which is a word picture of what's going to happen in the thousand year reign of Christ. This is going to sound scary, but it's true. So those who want to do harm to you that are in Christ, uh, that's a whole different level than those who aren't even in Christ at all. That's a whole different thing. That's even worse. The whole hell thing, that's not the same thing. So it, so there's a whole different thing for them people. But for those people in Christ who want to do irreverent things, disobedient things, then God's going to say, okay, well then you're going to have your up and comings. So in 1 Peter 4, 17, he says, where if the, uh, if the judgment and the house of God is going to be at the place where if the righteous person is scarcely safe, where shall the sinner appear? So judgment begins at the house of God, he says, and the righteous person is scarcely safe, where would the sinner appear? You're like, okay, what? And that's like crazy. It's scarcely safe. I thought I was good to go when I believe in Jesus. And what he means by that is, yeah, but 1 Corinthians 3, you could be saved but as through fire. Because just because you're God's kid doesn't mean you get a free pass on being not accountable. You will at one point be forever restored with peacefulness and all that. But there could be a duration of time based on your obedience, lack of collaborative walk of faith, that you have to endure a consequence. Jonah endured that. He got restored. Just like in the thousand year reign of Christ, there's going to be a judgment. Some folks will go to this place and get restored. Paul talks about that, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and he talks about it to remind you, since we're in the review, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and he talked about it in, in verse 8, 9, and 10, and he said, uh, in the flame of fire, just, well, verse 7, I should say, well, what's well, in the whole context? I'm getting, I'm getting in the middle of the context. But in verse uh, 6, I was going to talk about this anyway. So this is going to get, let me get, let me start where I was going to talk about anyways, and I'll go into your issue. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, the very key verse I thought in this chapter was two verses, verse 4 and verse 11. Because in verse 4 he talked about, so that we ourselves boast in you among the congregations, or called out ones, of God on account of your, of the patient endurance, which is the re resilient resolve, and the faith, or I should say of faith, I should say, and all of your persecutions, that people that are pursuing after you and constantly harassing you, and your afflictions, that's your pain. And he goes into, but they, the word persecution is written in the ois, so it's specific to being pursued because of those people in Thessalonica for the specific beliefs that they have about those in Christ conflicting with them because they don't want to believe that Gentiles can not only be in Christ, but have an inheritance in the heavenlies that the Jews themselves didn't understand. And then he goes on to talk about how in verse 5 it was a token of the righteous judgment of God. And the word token means it's a validation, it's a sign that this is part of maturity, having people come after you. So spiritual warfare 
is a term that we use in, in, in Christendom to kind of say different things, but it can mean different things, different levels. I don't know what you mean by it, but I can say that in this case, spiritual warfare can take many faces. It could be literally what you would know more than me, I don't want to know, the dark forces aspect of it. That could be that, no, no doubt, right? It could be that. And it could be also just different spiritual warfare where people are just, you know, uh, being really unkind and, and wicked to you as people in Christ. Yes, sorry, babe. Uh, Vicki asked, where are we? Tracy said verse 4. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, yeah, and verse 4. Then in verse 5, he, he talked about how uh, this is a token of for you to be deemed worthy. In other words, it's an ongoing. And that word's written in the ongoing. In other words, the, per the persecutions and, and, and afflictions will never stop. So spiritual warfare takes many faces, but it's not going to be the same for everybody and because our maturities are different. What you will find is that the spiritual warfare you're talking about is, this is no offense when I say this, but it's for people that um, haven't gotten to where Paul's talking about to these people, where's what we're talking about as a congregation. So we as a called out ones, we don't even deal with that because it doesn't, because Satan <laughs> doesn't even care to do that for us. Uh, or with because he's all about deception where we're at he's about deception and and when it comes to uh, what you're talking about is a whole different level so the dark forces issue comes after people that are in that realm of being of covenant that they know who God is but don't know who Jesus is they don't know God they don't know God at all they know the God of covenant who they, that he's the one true God or they know Jesus but only at the level of just that Jesus and the word of God they don't know any more of the depths of what inheritance means and what accountability means and what does that mean to a person in Christ of different stations that are going to be with, distant from or close to him in the next life. And this is no offense, you just don't, you've probably never heard that before. So because you don't know that, he's coming after you in, in this different way. Once you know that, he knows that those ways, those ways aren't effective. They're just not. Except uh, we do see that they can scare and bring fear, as we saw with Elijah, and the only way they become affectious in someone's life who's supposed to be walking in maturity of a deeper truth is when they get presumptuous and get arrogant, which is what happened with Elijah, which is why when Jezebel manifested a demon in front of him, he was kind of freaked out by that. He was like, what? And this is after he had, he had just by himself the story, you know, Elijah, chariot. Okay, so Elijah in the Old Testament uh, was the first prophet since Moses who was used by God to do way more miracles than they had ever seen since the days of Moses. They hadn't seen this kind of miracle since Moses. And there's a good hundreds of years difference. Um, you're talking about 700 uh, AD, or excuse me, BC, and then you have Moses 700 years before that. So it's a good gap in there. Well then all of a sudden you have Elijah doing all these miracles and then what you have happen is he thinks he's the only one there is. And he confronts the king, which scripture says was the worst king of all the kings before him and after him, no one was worse than Ahab. Okay, so to Elijah's point, to defend him, he thinks he's all alone because no one else has shown miracles that God's used them like God's using him. So to defend him, I mean, I mean, I could see where he could go, I'm kind of special. Well, I, I see that. And then, oh, God's special in my life, you know, whatever. And then he sees he's going against one of the worst kings ever. So. He must be pretty unique to be used against, you know, one of the greatest adversaries. Okay. So then he's married to a woman who's like a hybrid offspring, by the way, as an angelic host had relations with women and had offspring. She comes from this background. She ain't cool at all. What's that? Nephilim. Yeah, Nephilim. Yep. She's from that kind of background. She has a weird, wicked background. She was from Baal and all this. And so she's wicked to the core. And then later on, Ahab and, and, and Elijah have this meeting about Carmel, Mark Carmel, and of course you know, he does the whole God answers by fire and versus, uh, versus um, by water, dousing the, the sacrifice. And of course the prophets of Baal, nothing happens, and then God answers, and, and he throws all these prophets, thousands of them, over. He, he, cuts, he kills them with a sword, then kicks them off a cliff. All by himself. They'll just kind of like, they'll just kind of cower down, they kowtow and just, they just, I mean, they don't bull rush him they don't go against him they're just so like what just happened because they they chanted all morning and all night and their god did nothing their false god Baal Satan and then God comes in and engulfs the ring of fire with, with, with flames engulfs the, 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 the altar of sacrifice with flames and Elijah even made fun he goes oh where's your guys he's sleeping he's on vacation he's making fun like ha 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 and, and, and so with all that being said, that's why they were kind of like awestruck, like, um, okay, 
So as far as they were concerned, this, this guy is, God's using him to channel the power of God. Well, the point is, they were all cast, they were killed and cast off the cliff. Then as soon as you, Ahab goes back to go see Jezebel and tell, him, tell her what happened, his wife, the queen, the evil one, who's like the, the marionette behind the scene, he then has Jezebel send a, a confrontation of a demon to manifest, and he freaks out. After seeing what God just did in and through him, not to mention miracles before that, where a boy raised from the dead, God supplied uh, food for lasting years that should have lasted just days. I mean, it's crazy time what Elijah saw, and yet he's still scared of a demon. Who cares? But and it would. But he ran so far. He ran thousands of miles down south. He he just hightailed it out of there. He ran. Just kept running. He ran through the northern kingdom, southern kingdom, went down to where they came from Egypt. He was waiting, and then God, he's where Moses was at the time, and God goes, basically paraphrase, son, come here. So this is what Second Thessalonians is talking about. In essence, to the fact, in essence to the fact that, hey, look, you got to be strong enough to not get caught up in the presumptuous arrogance that you're all alone or the fear that some of these spiritual dark forces can, can have their hold on you. God's already shown you that they have nothing, they have no, they have no effect on you at all at, at his level. He should have known that. And that's what God was telling him. At your level, they don't really, that's just all like an illusion magic show as far as you're concerned, Elijah. For the other folks that don't know what you know, yeah, they can run scared. I get that. But you shouldn't be doing that. Not at his level. Uh -uh. Nope. They should have been like, okay, what, that's not, you can't hurt me with that stuff. That doesn't bother me. It doesn't even come after him, you know? And so in this case, in, in first, um, the, the chapter 1 of Second Thessalonians, it falls into this story. That's why he says that you have to be deemed worthy through the afflictions in verse 5 of, of, the, of the first chapter. And he talked about this worthy is, is the ongoing tense. And it's for the kingdoms of God, because there's two. The word kingdoms is plural, which is plural because God the Son reigns over the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth as King and Judge. Then God the Father is on the earth for another thousand years. They call Day of God the thousand years God the Father, and Day of the Lord for the thousand years of Christ. So there's two thousand years. Well, you could actually be, and like he says later on in verse seven and eight, you could be like verse six actually segues and says, if indeed it is just with God to repay affliction to those who afflict you, so also to you the afflicted they rest together with us at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven uh, and, and with the angels of his power in a flame of fire dispensing retributive justice on those not acknowledging God, to those not being, dis for those not being obedient to the glad tidings of our, our Lord Jesus. So what he's talking about here is he's saying, let me tell you something, there's, there's retribution coming and accountability is coming. Because when Jesus comes back on the white horse, and he talks about that in the first epistle. But the second epistle, he's making, he talks about, he edifies them, how much they mean to him. He edifies to your question, hey, what do we do? They're coming at me. These Jewish people who know more of the scripture than I do are coming at me, man. I don't know what to say to them because they know more than I do about Hebrew and about language. I don't know about this monotheism. It's just new to me. And so, and Paul's like, I know, but for six months I did train you. You should have some better, better conviction. And, but they're a little bit leaking the knees because they're they got also the Jews heard that too, so they were already uh, at a leg up and got the same education from Paul, and they were using it against the Gentiles to 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 really buffet them and, and insult them and cause factions, so much so they were trying to even threaten their own freedoms because Thessalonica was a free area, uh, they didn't have any Roman procurator over them, so they hated them so much they're willing to give up their freedoms, because Rome was going to have somebody come there and to calm down the tumults. And so that's how much they didn't like other people in Christ having a leg up on them. They were willing to give up their own freedoms just to spite you. That shows a lot of hatred, a lot of bitterness, a lot of, a lot of uh, pride. And so anyway, so with that being said, so Paul's basically earmarking in 2 Thessalonians as he ends the first book with, hey, don't forget who you are, don't lose sight of, the, the, don't forget them, don't lose sight of who God is in your life and the future out ahead of judgment. He, he builds them up, edifies them, and then he talks about chapter 4 of the first book, the, end, the, the, the coming of the Lord, the perusia, his messianic reign. And at the end of tribulation, what's going to happen and how the living ones are those who are in this mature level. You don't know if you're immature or, or your living ones, excuse me, of the sperma, of the deeper truths. You don't know if you're mature ones or immature ones. You think you are, you hope you are, but you're going to find out real quick when God either takes you or leaves you behind. And you're like, oh, that's how I know. So, okay, so he, goes, he says, well, if you are the living one who's alive and you remain here, don't worry, you still have another chance at the end of tribulation to still be given a reprieve. And so this is what we, this is what we, we would, uh, scripture was 
mimicking or God's mirroring and mimicking what he did in the Old Testament and the captures away from Babylon. So there was four waves of capture from Babylon where the Jews were taken out. It took the headship, then the next the people in charge. It took them by priority of their position. So there was like the leadership, then the heads of the army, and so they took them out. And so the same is going to happen in the rapture. There's going to be waves of people going out. So there's going to be wave one of a small group before tribulation. Wave two, right before the, the second half, the first half is about to end, I should say, the last 30 days. Then all of a sudden the Antichrist is killed and he raises up from the dead. Then this, the other wave happens. And then after that, no wave happens until the end of tribulation. And that's what the other folks that are here, that's why Paul's writing to the first Thessalonians 4 folks, is to say, if you're that last group, it's going to be pretty scary because it gets real dark real fast. And every demonic, hateful horror movie you've ever seen is going to be on steroids times a million because this guy is going to run the whole world into the ground. And Satan's going to be such a powerful being at that time all demons, all satanic forces will be so powerful that nobody will be able to live unless Christ comes back and shortens the days. He even says that. So you're like, whoa, okay. So he talked about that at First Thessalonians. But he ended with this segue into, okay, but live your life in a way that's conducive, that's becoming of who you are. And he starts up the second book with kind of, a, kind of an interesting segue. He ends this second epistle which is only three chapters, with that same thought. Hey, remember how you live is what matters here. What you know is important, but how you live it out, it, 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 it matters. Because in both books about prophetic things, he brings up how you live at the end of each book, of each epistle. What a coincidence. But in this one, he starts off with the meat of the bones with this prophetic stuff, whereas in the first epistle, he had to, he had to kind of work up to it. It was five chapters, and he took the last two chapters to do that. Where in this one, he starts out, out of the gate with it. So in verse 7 and 8, he's basically saying, don't forget that the, the people he says here, where he talks about how in a flame of retributive justice, he's going to, in verse 8, uh, dispense uh, this justice. Remember, there's going to be people that are going to be, when Jesus is, re is coming back, it says in the uh, second epistle, second uh, chapter of 2 Thessalonians, that by the breath of his mouth. So here's Satan. Darkness has spread throughout the world. The physical world is so, is so dark physically the moon, the sun, everything is darkened physically, spiritually, everything about it, it shows despair and wickedness and evil and it's just not a place you want to live. And so with all this being done, so imagine any kind of, I don't know, movie or sport or true life analogy you want to have, you can, you can take Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini, combine them into one person and times that times a million, that's kind of what it's going to be like on the earth, okay? And so, imagine every horror movie you've ever seen, from Amityville Horror to Jason and Freddy and all those Amityville Horror, all those scary things, the exorcists, all that's Jeepers Creepers, all that's gonna be for real. And all of a sudden you're like, what? And then there's gonna be demons guarding food supply, water supply, it's gonna be bad. And so, all of a sudden this is gonna be so scary. And all of a sudden Jesus comes in the clouds with the white horse. He just is seen on the white horse coming. Angels and the saints are filling the heavenly clouds. He comes on the white horse, he just goes, <sighs> he breathes out. Well, if he says something, I don't know. It just says by the breath of his mouth, he's dead, just like that. So we're like, okay, that was crazy. So that wasn't even a fight. That was just like a foregone conclusion. You just kind of, <sighs> and he's gone. That's just how powerful. People think the opposite of God is Satan. <laughs> no, opposite of God is nothing because a creator has no opposition to his creation. It's all creation. He's creator. So there's no opposition. There's none. And so when he comes back, it's going to be not a big fight as every movie likes to do or Hollywood likes to juice it up or gin up that base of people's concepts. It's not like good and evil, good and bad, black and white. No, no. It's pretty quick. It's a pretty, it's just a, it's over. And then he's dead. The beast is gone. False prophet Antichrist thrown in the lake of fire. Satan chained in the abyss. He's actually chained and locked behind lock and key. It's like, okay, he's thrown at the bottom, bottom of the, 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 the lake of fire in the abyss. He's put in chains, and the gate is locked, and there's a watchful guard over him. I think the picture, much, the picture is clear. He ain't getting out unless God lets him out, which he does, by the way, which is crazy, a thousand years later. But all that being said, Jesus has the breath of his mouth. Paul's talking about this in the first chapter of 2 Thessalonians. And he says, don't forget, as long as he come back, the breath of his mouth, boom, all evil is eradicated that was that was just pestering and and ruling and threatening the earth just like that 
And then the Gog and Magog, which is people coming against Israel, all these Muslim kings, with only a few are left and of the, those who are following the beast, he just goes, oh, you took the mark of the beast and you worshiped him. Okay. <laughs> they all just drop dead. He's like, he just drops him dead. And he goes, I got some work to do. And he goes to the Mount of Olives, he sets foot on it, and it splits in two. A mountain comes apart. Okay, if what you already saw wasn't like two eye dropping, eye dropping and eye piercing and all that stuff, that wasn't enough mind blowing stuff. Now he sets a foot on a mountain and it splits in two. I mean, this dude is, I mean, it's just like unbelievable, right? So God's doing, so then he takes his white horse down there and this miles long and wide valley, everybody that's ever been from the time of the Garden of Eden to that point, who's not taken the mark of the beast and who's not worshiped him, they were brought back to, the, to, back to life, spirit, soul, and body, and thrown in Jehoshaphat. And it's called the, the, the wrath of God, the, the great wine press of the wrath of God. And he just treads them for 75 days. You think Satan is powerful? No. The unbridled, unrestrained, 100% focused on one area, the full wrath of Almighty God is unleashed. <laughs> I don't want to be any part of that. And he takes his huge sword out of his sheath, and he himself takes about 2 billion people and just mass murders them who have never believed in him at all, rejected God, rejected Christ, and he just pulverizes them and tramples their blood and their bones and their flesh into nothingness until so it just gets absorbed into the dirt. For 75 days, he makes them feel every single ounce of that pain in their spirit, soul, and body. And then when they're done, he takes their soul and spirit back to him, as Ecclesiastes 3 talks about, and they're no more. He goes, I'd rather have that than hell. Uh, yeah, easy for you to say. Uh, they don't experience people in the Hades fire we call hell. They don't experience the full unbridled indignation and wrath of God. No, they don't. That's nothing like that. This is bad. Real bad. And he's doing it personally. No one else is helping him. It's just him. It's so bad that the bridles of the horse are blood about four feet high, which on his big robe and sash I can only see and imagine in my mind when he gets on the great white, I mean, excuse me, the Bema seat, the Bema seat, a high lifted up platform to judge us in Hebron, he's gonna just probably just swoosh this thing out as he sits down. You're gonna see this thing fly out and see this dipped in blood garment. That's my judge? Yeah. Yeah, so so much for dancing and singing before him. No, that ain't gonna happen. That'll happen later, but not there. Not at first. It's a sobering wow moment. Just like Pontius Pilate looked down on him, Ironically, it'll be the other way around. We'll be looking up at him as he judges us. Well, and it's not because you're guilty or not guilty. That's not the judgment. It's about who, who's the haves and who's the have-nots. Who's going to have what's coming to him, basically, what he calls the inheritance. So you can be saved or in Christ, but the question is, what did you do with it? If you wasted it and squandered it, the prodigal son in the world, he was already the son of the father, picture of someone in Christ. He squandered his, his salvation of what it meant and his blessings and benefits. Then he comes back, but what happened was he said, I sinned against heaven and against you, Father. And the Father, as soon as he saw him, he ran to him. And he put his coat on him and his signet ring on him, and he gave him everything he ever possibly could imagine. So coming back to God, even though you went that off the rails, is the beauty of who our God is. No matter how far you go off the rails, before you stop breathing, every day is a chance for refreshing, restoration, and renewal. It's so cool like that. He's cool like that. He's like, if you die with not having that happen, then don't look at me when you get upset that I have a heavy hand of accountability. I mean, even then, he gives us chances to make right. I mean, he has clemency after opportunity after opportunity. So when he has his heavy hand go down, he's like, oh, please, give me a break. First of all, you put the things in motion as human beings desiring sin. I chose to love you, and I don't have to, and I did, so... And there's all these different things that we just take for granted. And I always make the mention now if a person goes to an orphanage, there's 100 kids in there and it's on fire because some arsenic is, arsonist is an evil human who wants to kill kids. And then I'm driving by or someone's driving by and I stop and they save 90 of the 100 kids. Or the newspapers say, evil wicked man left 10 kids to die. That's not what it says. It says wonderful human, stops his car, saves 90 kids. What a saint. What a good dude. This, what a good gal. What a good people these were that did this. They don't say they let 10 die. That's not, we do that to God all the time. Oh, I can't believe that 
God did this. He's like, oh, please, you, we, us, we are accountable for sin. Satan's the author of sin, and we're his little pawns he's using. And God told us, hey, man, that's why you're a slave to sin or a slave to me. But either way, you can't get around the whole slave thing. You're a slave. You're a slave to sin, and when you are, Satan's your master. And when you're a slave to me, I'm your master. But guess what? There's no such thing as you being your own master. That's just a lie Satan tells you to make you think that you are free and you're not. You're bound by things you don't even understand. And you know better than anybody about that. So the reality is that it's, it's not a good thing. So in here, in 2 Thessalonians, he's reminding them of, don't forget the just desserts or the end result of where they're going to be, where you're going to be, all different players are going to be. So in verse 11 of 2 Thessalonians, he talks about, for which also we pray always concerning you that our God may esteem you worthy, you worthy of the calling of the calling, they said specific to their calling that they have, and may complete them, that means fill them up in every desire of goodness, which is the internal agathos goodness, and work of faith with power. So again, this I think is the two key verses in verse 4, to remind them of, of the perspective of, of persecutions and afflictions with the end result in mind. Know that it's, 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 it's purposeful, it's needful, it's necessary, it's mandatory to mature at that level. You're going to have that in your life. So don't act like, when people say to me, I have a charm life. You know, I got everything, is, my, I have a good health, I got a million dollars in the bank, my family loves me, I'm spiritually blessed. Really. So you would take that over in the next life, having the closest intimacy with Christ. I wouldn't. And I can tell you that what you just described, nobody in the scripture who got that level coming to them in the next life lived the life you just talked about. Not one person. Not one. I'd like you to tell me who it was. Because nobody lives that life in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Nobody could sit back, whether it was on the apostles or one of his saints in the Old Testament. They were kind of hated. And they were dogged. And they had some ha heinous experiences to go through. No one had this like, oh, you know, I was, I was, I was wealthy. Uh, and financially, and uh, uh, my parents, well, all my family was healthy, and uh, and uh, yeah, everybody loved me, so I was good. Yeah, right. And okay, sure, yeah, right. But people sell that to you today. They sell that lie to you. And if you don't achieve that lie, then it makes you think that God's lying. So, because it is a lie, but people believe it, so they go, oh, since I'm not able to experience it, then the congregation of God's a lie, and God's a lie, and it's all a big lie. So you go over to Satan, who is the liar, and he feeds you this garbage that you can't achieve that with him behind it. And it's like, oh my gosh. It's all because of the leadership of churchianity, to my opinion, is defunct. Instead of focusing on spiritual wealth, it's like the old adage, there's two kinds of wealth. There's the physical temporal wealth, or there's the spiritual eternal wealth. It's up to you which one you want. Can you have both? Sure. It doesn't mean that... <laughs> that I'd, pers I'd pursue physical over spiritual. No way, no way. He's just giving you perspective of the depth they have. But the very summary of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 gets even better uh, when he goes into saying in verse 2, hey, just remember, don't be quickly agitated in mind and don't be alarmed in, in your spirit by anything that you hear, all the rhetoric of, oh, Jesus, this uh, is coming this day. It's going to be this month and day and year. And if you don't know this, they've been saying that for a long time. They've been saying the eight reasons since for 1988 he's going to come. And then and it was Y2K. Then it was 2012, the Mayan calendar. And then it was, I don't know, it's always something, right? There's always somebody putting something in some magazine, in some publication, at some conference about, here's the mark of the beast. No, this is the mark of the beast. Oh, this is the mark of the beast. Stop. Don't just stop. Just, just, just remember the context of what happened. And he's saying, look, regardless of what that's going to be used or not to facilitate that, hey, whatever. But the point is, you shouldn't be focused on that because our focus should be on who we are. And what he's talking about here is the very first verse of that second chapter was that, remember, our assembly to him is what we have matters to us, the wedding feast. Now everybody gets to be a part of the wedding feast, as people say in church sanity. They go, oh, when you die and go to heaven, there's a big wedding feast, and, and God, has a, God has a feast. But remember, I've said this before. I myself have personally experienced my own family members have gotten married and did not invite me to the wedding for different reasons. So I am related definitively by blood and was never rsvp I never said an RSVP because so I was never invited. Just saying, okay? So that happens in real life all the time, okay? For different reasons. 
if you think that doesn't happen in the spiritual realm, you're mistaken. Because Paul is making it clear in the first epistle that that's what he's making them understand about their uniqueness. They were given an invitation. And again, I, I made this reference before of a true story of a little woman who's no longer alive, but Mary was her name, and she said, hey, President, since my husband died, it, 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 there's a royal wedding going on with uh, um, uh, was it William and Kate. And she, is, that was her, is that her name? I think it was William and Kate. And she goes, uh, and, and I, I want to be able to see that. When's the next time I'm going to see a royal wedding? So she actually paid $10,000 because she had tons of money. And she went to this weekend thing at this hotel for ten grand just to have a bird's eye view of the Buckingham Palace when they, walked, when they came by. Um, and she loved it. And she never regretted that. And then she ended up dying. And she talked about that for the rest of her, di her days when she could remember before she got Alzheimer's. But the beauty of it is, imagine if you had a chance to see the biggest royal wedding of all time in Heavenlies. And people act like that's just everybody gets a chance to be there. No, you don't. It, 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 for, no, God invites a select few. And when you are invited, you better live up to that invitation. I can tell you that. You can't come with scruffs on and, and not be all duded up, ready to go, because that's just not acceptable. That's very disrespectful. And so that's what Paul's talking about in, in chapter 2, verse 1, is don't forget our assembly is the marriage feast. That's, the, that's, what, we're, that's what we're called to, this, this royal, wonderful, fantastic wedding. Now, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna hear songs all the time and I, and I i had this conference this week it was a zoom call conference and it was really a lot they, were, they played some christian music in it and what's interesting is that the christian music it, is it, i miss it in the sense of the emotion it drums up in you of the nice praise to god but the two things i i never liked about it or three things i don't like about it no offense this is all due respect god knows my heart what i'm trying to say here i don't like it when someone calls music that sings about god worship as if to infer that when I'm praying and studying and talking with God, I'm not worshiping Him. That's a lie. That is a lie. That is a lie. <laughs> you don't need music and a guitar and a, and a trumpet or a piano or your voice to sing to worship God. That is insanity. So what are you saying? If I'm mute and I have no hands, I can't worship God? Don't be ridiculous. Of course you can. You can worship God in your own spirit and truth. That's what God said, didn't He? That's his true worship first. He didn't say, who worship, who worship me in song and in an instrument. That's not what he said, so stop lying. That's called praise, okay? I can't stand it when they call music worship as if to infer it's the only way you can worship. I just, oh, stop doing that. Call it praise. That's what it is. You're praising God through song, through music, through instruments. It's wonderful. But don't make it sound like it's the only way you can worship. I just can't stand that. Number two, the words are off. They'll say things like, and God is good, and we are kings, and we are queens. Y you're what? No, you're not. Well, we belong to the king, so we are. No, no, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. Stop, stop saying that. And we're going to rule, and we're going to reign. No, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. Stop saying that. They, 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 just, they, they blur lines together. They just blur. They don't care what the details say. They take whatever they, it's like, it's like they take whatever they want out of, out of history it's like, imagine you doing that in history, in world history. Imagine doing it in world history, and you find someone that looks like you, and I, I impute every evil of what that person did to you, and every good, I don't give it to you. What? 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 It's just so ignorant. You can't pick and choose what you want from Scripture because it fits your narrative of a nice emotional song. I just, I don't like that either. So, I don't like they, how they phrase it. I don't like how they blur the lines of, of, of the words. But it doesn't change the fact, what I do like about it is it's wonderfully emotionally charging to get your mind and spirit kind of remembering why God made music to begin with. God made music to praise Him. It's just the, the trees, I mean, they, they, they clap their hands like, what? I mean, there's actually a few, there, there's been sh things that whales make sounds in the ocean as if to praise God. You can, you can actually hear the stars at certain vibrations make sounds to praise God. It sounds, like, it sounds like an orchestra out in the heavens if you actually had the ear to hear it. And I've heard these things from the NASA uh, satellites. You can actually put this high depth of definition. You could hear like this sound that stars make because they have vibrations. And it's like an orchestra of beauty. And so, yeah, you can definitely have voice and you can have instruments that praise God. That's the beauty. That's the part I love the most. What I don't like is the way they phrase it, the way they use the wrong words. And then lastly, I don't like the fact that only because of those things, it gives people the wrong impression. Meaning this, that it gives an impression that this is just a book of dry bones. Dead people wrote this. They're dead. They're gone. It's just a book of words. 
come to the concert, man. Hear the drums and everybody, hallelujah, Jesus. And I got Jesus. Well, that's good. I, I love that. But w- wait a minute. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't play that off of this as if to say that that makes you excited and this does it. So you're telling me that you get more amped up emotionally hearing words and music, instruments, than you do reading this book. Because that's, I don't like that. Because you're making it sound that way. You certainly, and don't tell me you don't think that. Yes, you do. Stop lying. Yes, you do. I know you do, so I see it. <laughs> you have to tell me, I see it in my own eyes. No one acts that way. And then no one, no one I've ever talked to, I shouldn't say no one, very few people I talk to say, man, they were all jazzed up. I mean, what I read today was unbelievable, man. I, t- I can't believe it. Oh, what we studied last night was, was just was awesome. And they just keep talking about it. But you do that from concerts, don't you? You sing the song all the way home in the car. You sing the song that are on the weekend, right? Because you let the emotion charge you up of voice and sound, but of an instrument, but not of God's word. What about his voice? Does that matter for anything? I'm just wondering, doesn't that matter? And doesn't the melody of the beauty of what he's saying, what's out ahead, shouldn't that resonate joy? That's why I have so much voice infliction at times. People say, well, you get emotional. Well, that's why. This is your concert in God's word, okay? So that's what Paul's reminding him of. Our great concert, our great our great gathering is the wedding feast. That's the concert of all time, my friends. That's the, it's for the ages. Let me tell you something. You don't want to miss that. Because what leads up to that is this great coronation of the king. Which they talk about this. But just imagine all that heinous thing happens with, with him right by his mouth. He kills Satan. Gog and Magog. Flat people dead. Jehoshaphat. You're talking billions of people just die. And then after all that horrific stuff happens, he sets up a judgment seat and judges us in just four months all of us in Christ. Then, out of the ground, he just raises up a temple. And the angels and everybody just in awe as he starts to have this coronation. I don't know how the song's going to sound, but I keep thinking it's fanfare for the common man. If you don't know that song, or that orchestration composition from Eric Copeland, it goes, bum, 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 bum. It's going to be very, even more than that, profoundly awesome. Heaven, earth, and underneath earth will be shaking and just the awe of that coronation of the king. That is awesome. <laughs> so you want to be there. You want a front row seat to that. Now that's the regal thing you don't want to miss. Yes? Um, Lainey said, sounds like Israelites in a valley. Him and, uh, hyped on emotion and more. Not that bad, however. Yeah, and again, I, and I'm not poo-pooing the emotion. Emotion's great. It's fantastic. If it wasn't good, God wouldn't have given us emotions, okay? God gave us emotion. God gave us choices. God gave us a will. It's not free, but he gave us a will, choices, responsibility, accountability. Those are all good things. But And then it's like that whole thing. They say, never have I ever. Well, guess what? Never have I ever heard a sailor or a person of the navigation of the seas ever take a compass and go, I hate this thing. It always says north is north. I want it to be south. What? That makes no sense. You don't hate, well, it's absolute, I hate it. No, absolutes kind of help you quite a bit when the wind and rain turn you back to front. You don't know what the heck's going on. When the sky's dark and the waves are, you're gulping in seawater, and you're going to think you're upright walking God, that you've got a, a compass that tells you that way is north. Trust me, you're going to like that. Absolutes are great things when they become the anchors that keep you from sinking. They become the preservers that rescue you from death's shade. You're going to thank your upright walking God that you have something like that as his word, as he is the living word. That's who he is. So the whole reality is that when you get to the Second Thessalonians chapter 2, he, he talks about, again, context of remembering things of the first verse of what's out ahead for us, but don't let things agitate you. Don't let the latest thing on social media, the latest conference, the latest this. And by the way, I'll be admitting it. I, hey, I'll, I'll start with Alcoholic Anonymous. I'll, I'll be the first one. Hey, my name is Preston, and I too got caught up in the fact that I was upset how the election went because I, didn't, I thought it was unrighteous the way votes weren't counted and people wouldn't even, whether it was true or not, people say, hey, you know, I'm sure or not. You know what? I don't know all the details, but I know this. It certainly doesn't sound right. I'll tear people's voices out. That doesn't sound right to me. Not having people actually hear their voices out, having, having states look at the evidence, sounds like a lot of impropriety was going on. And yes, I got caught up in some of that. And yes, I was upset about that. And yes, I wanted to see something come about that was a different result. And yes, it didn't happen. But you know what? It's not my will, is it? It's God's will be done. So it's done. It doesn't, I'm, I'm over that. It's done. I don't like the result, but I live with it. You think the Elijah liked he was 
in the northern kingdom with not one good king, <laughs> right? We talked about that before, right? So, but the whole thing is in verse 2 of chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians, to review, he's reminding people, don't let your current social, governmental, and environment, whatever it is, let that dictate what your thoughts should be. The truth still the truth, regardless of what they gin up against you or what they're ginning up to rise up an emotion or a pain point of mental, uh, you know, a thorn. D don't let those things get you off the focus of our assembly together with him. Chapter 2, verse 1 is what matters. I told you to, I implored you to remember what he told you, what Paul told you, which is what God in Christ told him, which he covers the issues of the man of sin, son of destructions, and the lawless one is left out of the, of the consecutive order. He says the opponent. Then he goes back to the lawless one in verse 8 of 2 Thessalonians, who is the beast incarnate by Satan. He takes the body of the Antichrist who was possessed, who then was killed, lies dead for three days, and then Satan goes into that body and, in, and in, incarnates him. That is scary time. And that's what happens. And that's, when that happens, you have the hundred fruit people that have that already been gone for three and a half years. You have the 60 fruit, other mature ones, they're taken out 30 days before that, uh, and then the other one's taken out right, right after that. And then who's left is uh, <laughs> not gonna like what they see. And so then the mark of the beast comes into play at that point, because that's why it's called that, because he's the beast at that point. And then we see in verse five, as Second Thessalonians, he, remind, he reminds them, do you not remember that while I was with you, I said these things to you? So in other words, again, these weren't, these weren't new people in Christ, they were new to deeper truth in Christ. And remember, I put on the side of the board, for context, taking a step back, take a deep breath for a second here. Um, so therefore, what's happening is, like in the book of Acts, you remember when it says 5,000 rounded to the church in that day. 3,000 in that day. For context, who we're talking about here in Thessalonians, remember what happened then at Pentecost. We, to this day, have churchianity keep on trying to tell us, oh, Pentecost is every day, there's revival, hallelujah. No. You know, I know it's not true. You go, I know it's true, because look, I speak in tongues. Blah, 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 blah. First of all, that you're faking it, so stop it. And secondly, um, that's not how it worked. You spoke a language you didn't know, and the person who knew the language could tell you what you just said. So they could speak in German, Spanish, Russian, whatever, and they could hear what you're saying, even though you don't speak that language like at all. So I'm speaking my normal language right now, and they heard it in their language. That's what tongues was. The, new, the King James added the word unknown. It was not the original text. Humans added that to clarify, and it caused more confusion. It's all lies. But the more important thing about Pentecost is not the tongue thing. It's really about the fact that um, <laughs> you're talking about in one day. This, I kind of just soaked this in for a second. So in one day, the equivalent of what happened at Pentecost, which ties into Thessalonians, is because what happened in one day is they went from not knowing about Jesus. They know nothing. They know nothing. So they learn about him, and they grow in a depth of understanding of him in such a way they know what we the scripture calls mysteries, which again, to remind you, Jesus said in, in Matthew 13, they're only privy to be given to some people, not to everyone. I, I, not my words, his. Matthew 13, 11 to 15. And then, as we go on, the equivalent of that would be, we have a grandson from Puerto Rico. I've never been there. I don't speak Spanish. I took Spanish when I was in high school, but can't speak it. I understand certain words I could pick up on, but I really can't talk it. However, the equivalent of having a Pentecost, happening again today, would be the equivalent of me going to Puerto Rico, San Juan, and in one day, I learn Spanish and I speak it fluently. Yeah, right. That ain't happening, okay? There's no way that's happening. That's a, it, maybe it could if you're a savant, if you're a Mozart, you can create compositions for your 18. Maybe so. Maybe the Rosetta Stone of language. But the, the odds of someone learning about Christ in one day, learning about him and then growing to a level of depth of understanding is insanity. That's what was happening when they had 5,000 and 3,000 added. They were adding to the called out ones. That's why Pentecost can't be duplicated. Those who keep on saying that, no offense, are ig nor rent. They have no knowledge of what they're talking about. They're trying to repeat some emotional issue. It's, <laughs> it's more than emotions, dude. The reason they were emotional is because you'd be too if you saw it happen. 
If you understood about composition now, what you know about compositions now, and you were there when Mozart was composing all these compositions, if you were there when Handel went destitute from Germany to England, and then was destitute on the side of the street, and was praying to God, I don't want, I want, to, I don't want to live anymore, and then in one day, in a couple hours, wrote the Messiah, yeah, okay, if you were there to watch that, you'd be emotional too. But don't give me this garbage that the emotion is what that was all about. No, it wasn't. It was about God's power displaying itself in such a way where he was showing off for a specific purpose, for a specific time, that is not going to be repeated. But our charismatic friends keep on saying it is. They're wrong. They're wrong. Okay? And so, therefore, in Thessalonians, what's happening is what also doesn't happen anymore. Why? It's one of the questions that Brother Todd asked. We're going to get to it later on Q&A in a couple weeks. But it's about, I'll lead into a little bit, it's about how the mysteries were sown. They had the fullness of God's truth without the leaven taking foothold yet. Remember, there's two groups of leaven. Leaven is a type of sin in the Bible. You know that easily. Don't believe me. Because in the book of Exodus, when the Passover was being going on in Exodus chapter 11 and 12, God said, not me, I'll put a distinction between the Jew and the Egyptian. And you'll know definitively the difference between the two people. Why is that important? Because they were adopting each other's culture. Because the Egyptians, believe it or not, under Joseph being the second in charge Pharaoh, he influenced them to believe in the one true God. This goes back to our study from a long time ago, where the Hyksos were, an, or they, were a Semitic tribe who came in and ransacked Egypt, and the Egyptians began to have some hatred toward the Jewish people. And you know that the Hyksos came in whenever you start to see chariots in old historical Egyptian folklore, because they brought chariots into, into Egypt. That's how they took them over. They didn't have chariots before the Hyksos came. When the Hyksos came in, and then they overthrown later on by the Egyptians, they took back their kingdom, then they kept the chariots from that point forward. So when you see chariots in Egypt, right away you know that's post Hyksos domination. Before that, they didn't have that. So why is that important? Because they came in and created the animosity toward the Semitic or Hebraic or Jewish people, which is why they didn't like them later on. So that some of them began to go back to polytheism. Some still like monotheism. And God said, enough! I'm not going to have this malarkey garbage going on anymore. My people are be distinctly earmarked from the Egyptians. So that he did a Passover. And at the Passover, he, what did he say about the leaven bread? He said, take the leaven bread out of your house, a type of sin. And Jesus talked about it in Luke and in Matthew. There's two leavens. There's the leaven of the Word of God, and there's leaven of the mysteries, of the secret of the kingdom of the God. And so, therefore, that leaven has sown itself into the bread. Well, back then, it hadn't leavened all the way yet. There's your hint to answer your question. But the reality is, it wasn't leavened all that way yet. So you can't repeat what happened here. You can't have people in six months go from not knowing about Jesus to knowing about Jesus to a point where not only do they know Jesus, but they have a depth of the Word of God, understanding of mysteries. That's insanely crazy time. That doesn't happen. I'm telling you right now. What I know now, <laughs> Let me see. Uh, I learned about Christ when I was in March 12th, 19. Well, I was a young kid, a Catholic. I knew rudimentary stuff. I started to learn some depth of the Word of God, March 12th, 1990. I didn't learn the mysteries until June 1993, and it wasn't until I was called to ministry in 2002 uh, that then I started to have a different depth, and it wasn't until recently that I know what I know now. But you're going to tell me that 20 plus 7, that's 27 years, 28, 21. So 27, 28 years go by for me to get to where I'm at. These folks did that in six months. That's insane. <laughs> that's insane. But that, not because they're smart. It's because they had God and Paul as the teacher. I mean, <laughs> give me a break. This is God that God gave more wisdom than anybody who ever walked this planet in a in Christ situation. Solomon had different kind of wisdom. It was more worldly driven. Paul had heavenly wisdom like no one. And Peter said it's difficult to understand what he's saying. And it take, took me 27 years to get to where I'm at just to imagine these folks were being introduced to these thoughts and concepts at six months in. It's unbelievable. It's just in, it's incomprehensible for people to, to be able to understand that. I just can't understand it all. But this is what he's talking about when he's going into saying, hey, do you guys remember what I said to you? Do you know, you know you're, how unique you are? They're a bunch of Mozarts. They're all savants compared to us. But back then, that was normal. It was normal back then, back in the day. Because why? Again, leaven wasn't having its, its way yet, and all the bread wasn't leavened yet. 
and yet God himself empowering this person, the Apostle Paul. Pretty powerful stuff. But then he goes on in verse uh, 13. I want to end with this, uh, this uh, summary issue of, from chapter 2 to chapter 3. He said, but we are bound to give thanks. That means they're indebted to give thanks. In chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians, verse 13, they're bound to give thanks to you, brethren, be beloved by the Lord, because God chose you, it says first fruit, or from the beginning into salvation in sanctification of spirit and belief of truths, plural. And the word truths, plural, is a key verse here because it speaks to what the sanctification means. Remember, Jesus prayed in John 17, may they be sanctified in truth. Your word is truth. Let me help you understand this. Remember this. Paul said to them later on in verse 15, in the same chapter, he said, So then, brethren, stand firm and retain the instructions you were taught. Now, stand firm means to be ever planted and established, like he's been trying to tell them in the first epistle. He also says, in the instruction. What instruction? The word tradition means to pass down to the hands of another. Where did Paul get his teaching from? From Hebrew? From the Judaism? No, 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 no. Was he a Jew? Yes. Was he a Hebraic? Yes. He made it very clear in Acts 15, Jerusalem Council. He wasn't about the Hebrew roots movement. That's a no-go. He was taught, his, his my gospel was about the gospel that God gave him, not what he took from what he understood, what he was imputed by Christ himself, being knocked on his butt and having scales in his eyes fall off. I think that kind of makes a mark on you forever when you see the spirit of Christ, I'm, I'm who you persecute. Oh, okay. I mean, that's pretty, it's pretty profound. So, and he's for three years taught face to face by Jesus on the backside of the desert where Moses got the Ten Commandments. That's pretty amazing stuff. So, no one else had that private tutoring, not, not to mention for that long. So no wonder he was like Googleplex smart, as I call it. And so when he's talking about my gospel and he's saying my instruction, he means, yeah, you know, you know, the one I got from, you know who. Yeah, the one I, <laughs> you know, when I was out three years away in the desert, you know who taught me. And you, know, you don't have to doubt that because you can hear me talking. This isn't my words. Just, I'm not that good. I'm not this smart. He's just telling you time and time again, it's about the instructions or the traditions I got from Christ that he passed on to me that I'm passing on to you that he first introduced when he was here on the earth and no one understood what he was saying because no one had ears to hear or eyes to see as he said the clearly ways of the depth of what he was talking about and he gave Paul those ears to hear and eyes to see and then Paul was helping us to do the same so with that being said the sanctification in spirit remember that's a lot of, lot of noise isn't it so sanctification in spirit is different from sanctification in truth because remember we're spirit and we're soul, and we're body. So in our body, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's where God dwells. And so God says how we treat ourselves, how we treat our body as a temple, how do we, how do we take care of ourselves? Our hygiene, our exercise, our diet. People say, oh, that's the most important thing. No, no, that's just, that's just like upkeep of the building. That's all you're doing. That's all that is. I'm not gonna judge you for it. Hey, we all got issues, man. None of us do this, any of these things correctly. So let's get that straight to begin with. None of us do these things correctly I'm talking about right now. But it's what we have to hold ourselves to at least something of a standard to remind ourselves, not to get down on ourselves, just to remind ourselves of, the, of what to aim for. That's all. That doesn't say you don't, don't get, you love, your, love, accept yourself for who you are because God loves you where, we, where we're at, but always wants us to be better, right? He wants us to grow and mature, not to stay stagnant. Wants us to grow, mature, improve, always, progress, be transformed, the image of his son. So therefore, the body is a temple from which our hygiene, our exercise, diet is how we take care of the building. Okay, what's our soul? That's our life, our suke, right? Well, that's where the scripture in 1 Thessalonians comes in when he goes, don't quench the spirit. It means to suppress the spirit. Well, wait a minute, what spirit? The spirit of Christ. Well, who's that? Wait, 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 wait. The spirit of Christ only, only comes into view once you already have the Holy Spirit instruct you in mind and in heart, then the Spirit of Christ takes the resources and builds out of it the fruit, which is love, singular, which manifests as gentleness, kindness, self-control, and all those things. It's as obedience. It's an act of obedience. So wait a minute. So I can quench, which means to suppress. I'm holding down, which means I can't suppress or quench the Spirit of Christ unless I have something to suppress. I have to first get truth in my life. I have to first get the truth of God's word in my life. I have to first understand who he is and what he says has to be deposited into my what? My soul? No, my spirit. 
My soul is what the Spirit of Christ uses to exposit out of my life the kalos, K-A-L-O-S, the external good works, from which if I don't, then if I have the truth, and I'm, he's not doing that, he's saying, you're suppressing me. You're quenching me. What's the deal? That's not good. You don't want that conversation. <laughs> so, so the reality is, then you say, well, wait, 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 what, what about grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, that happens in your spirit. You grieve the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of God the Father, because the Spirit of Christ is the Spirit of God the Son. Then the Holy Spirit, you're grieving Him because His job is to equip you, to convict you, to help you to understand. These are the tools you need to succeed. He's there to help you to commune with God, understand who you are, who you are in your Creator's eyes, what this book says. Then you go, okay, i got to learn. Yeah, duh. And then once you learn, you go, what do, I don't know what to do. And the Spirit of Christ says, I got it from here. It's like a relay race. I, I, I got it from here. The Spirit of Christ takes your inner disposition that the Holy Spirit has renovated in your heart and mind and spirit. He gives you an agathos disposition. He gives you a goodness disposition. Not that you are agathos, but that He is agathos in your life. And then He allows you not to grieve Him, which means make Him sad by saying, in Christ, I don't really care to show any gratitude. I don't care to have any concern over finding out about this God that saved me. Who would do something like that? But that's what he means by sanctification in spirit. It speaks to being set apart by God in, in our mind that we hold a premium on who he is and what his word says in our life. There's a premium we put on that at being set apart by who God is in our life and what his word speaks to us. Sanctification in spirit means that we are not grieving the Holy Spirit. We are, we, are, we are living in a constant agathos renovation of our internal disposition of our mind and of our heart. And then the sanctification in truth is with our soul, our life, is being affected on the outward expression of how we are to then ex ex exhibit those changes that happen internally and not to suppress that spirit to do those things as we are seeing ourselves being set apart and how we apply God's truth and love, right? So that's it. So the Spirit is our communion with God. Our sanctification in the Spirit helps us commune with God so that we then can sanctify in truth in our soul to display the, the love and truth of God so that the way in which we do either one of those things is going to be infectious in our body, our building that He dwells in, He calls His temple. It's pretty awesome stuff. But that's why He says in verse uh, 3, in chapter 3, but faithful is the Lord who will establish and guard you. So if they do these things they're supposed to do, he's like, let me tell you something. You keep maturing like you're supposed to mature, guys. <laughs> you got the best, you got the best watchdog, the best guard dog, the best military compound, the best, the best black ops team on your side. Because you didn't need a team, it's just him. And he's gonna personally take up ownership of making sure that Paneros, which you remember, the enemy, the, the Ectros, the opposition of God. Uh, who is the, is revealed as Diabolos, the devil, as the tempter. He, that's, he comes out all the people in Christ. He comes after them as that person. He comes after anybody in Christ as the, as the devil, as the tempter. But only a few he comes after as Satanus, as the deceiver. And then even fewer he comes after them as Paneros, which is called the wicked one, evil one. Or again, it means Paneros as the influencer. He's really slick and suave. And so God's saying, hey, even, even the most diabolical version of him, I got you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty awesome. So as long as you mature in your faith and pursue, he's trying to tell, he's telling them, all I just told you, all those, all those scary things that are about to come, even if you are here to see some of them, if you just focus on the God that you serve and who made you uniquely different, sanctify yourself in spirit and in truth, and then you have yourself be in congruence. That's why he said in the first epistle, May your whole body and soul and spirit be sanctified, preserved, preserved through the entire millennial reign. Then he goes on and talks about in verse uh, 4 and 5 and 6 of, of chapter 3 about how he says God's going to direct your hearts in the love of the God and the patience into the, into the, the patience or again the remaining under enduring resilience of Christ. What an example he did on that. Yes. Vicki said, are you saying that sanctification and truth, our callous good, comes out of our sanctification in spirit, the agathos good? Yep, that's right. 
Because sanctification, in other words, you can't have sanctification in truth. You can't have the truth of Scripture come out of you with God's love and truth unless you're in the right disposition to receive it. This is what the sower and the seed parable shows us, right? The seed's the truth. Did it always fall on good soil? <laughs> no. By the road, on the rock, and the thorns, right? And then there was good soil. So the soil was the issue. The seed is the truth. It didn't matter, did it, without the right soil. So the soil is the agathos disposition, which must be first in the right cultivation, communion with God, our spirit, sanctification and spirit. And then when we have that right, then we take in the truth. Now the truth can then be sown and planted and give forth the fruit it's supposed to. That's what he's talking about by, he starts off by not grieving the Holy Spirit, to allow yourself to be sanctified, sanctified, sanctified in spirit, communion with God, so that you have an agathos disposition, so that then when you take in the truth, it can take foot of hold in you, have the engrafted word, as James said, embrace that word in, in, in you, engrafted in you, so it brings out the fruit of the callous fruit that you have because you're not quenching or suppressing it. It's now coming out fluidly from you because your disposition is right. If you take this book with the wrong disposition, and haven't we seen this, by the way, in a movie called TV Evangelist, right? And, ba and bad, bad actors in churchianity. We've seen many of men and women take this book for nefarious gain. We've seen it. We've seen it, in old t we've seen it from Simon the sorcerer. <coughs> we see it from, Ga from Gehazi in the Old Testament with Elisha's little ment mentee. We see it all the time. We see it with Balaam trying to take a bribe to, get, to make money off God's people. We see folks try to sell God's word down the river for their own personal gain. I personally don't like it people prostitute Jesus. That's what they're doing. They're pimping out Jesus. But the reality is that the truth can be used for all kinds of gains, but the true gain is when it takes hold in your life and brings out of you the love and truth of God. And it can't do that unless you have the right disposition with an Agathos heart. He wants to do that, has the power to do that, but it's not going to do that because your sinful nature will override your manipulation and your iniquitous ways to twist and distort, and we see it every day. Just click on Christianity YouTube, you'll see tons of people doing that. No offense, I'm just saying. Yeah? What is Agathos? Agathos is the internal good disposition. It's A-G-A-T-H-O-S. And then Kalos, K-A-L-O-S, is the external goodness that is exposited out of the disposition of Agathos. So you can't do a good, you can't, someone, uh, the, basically the bottom line for that is no one who's not in Christ can possibly do a callous good. There's no way. You have to be in Christ to have, to have the foundation for the Holy Spirit to give you an Agathos disposition. So in Christ is where it first starts. And then from there, God can help you get an Agathos disposition to then from there give you a callous fruit on the outward manifestation of that. And he talks about also dealing with, I'll end with this, and he talks about the uh, last part of this chapter, chapter 3, about dealing with the disorderly people and how to live with folks and, and letting people uh, work with they, let, if you don't work, you don't eat. People say, I'm not spiritually fed. It's a, it's a physical that relates to the spiritual truth of it all. So, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't get fed in my church. That, 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 that preacher don't preach! Well then, okay, I just relax. Let me ask you a question. Do you, do you read your own Bible? They go, well, no, that's not my job. That's his job. Where does it say that? Where, show me where it says you don't have to study. Where does it say it's on, it's on the guy's job? Where, I don't know where it says that. At. I never read that verse. Where does it say, study shows up approved, you guys who teach the Bible, and everybody else will then be approved. I don't, I don't see that. <laughs> what are you talking about? You have individual accountability before God. And besides that, why would you want to have someone else do the heavy lifting for you when that's where all the, that's where the joy is found. You know, it's in the process, the process of learning. Someone was saying, uh, Howard Hendricks, is, I, think, I think he's passed on, I'm not sure, but he's noted as the one of those greatest Dallas Theological Seminary professors about how to equip teachers. He used to say, a, it's curt certain phrases I'll never forget, but he used to say, a, a teacher is a student among students, a, a sheep among sheep. He would say, teachers teach from the overflow. And one of the great examples he ever gave about studying his Bible, which I will never forget. He said, uh, it's one of his books, I think it was called The Treasured Teacher. I think it's in that one. 
But he talked about this example where the book of Psalm, think of a Psalm 1 actually, it's a short Psalm. <laughs> and he said, I want 100 observations you're going to write down and hand them in at, at the next time you're in class. So they handed him in, 100 observations. And they handed him in, and he goes, okay, now, ladies and gentlemen, the real work begins. And they're like, what real work begins? He goes, now I want you to get 100 more observations that can't duplicate the previous observations you made, and they're due by next, next class session. What? I just gave you 100 observations on like six verses, and now I gotta do 100 more that I can't duplicate. And I can't be fallacious like the word, I can't say, I saw the letter E three times. Nope, nope, no, nope, nope. Has to have some substantive reason why you're pointing out observations. Like, oh my gosh. So he was making them really dig in to see what's in God's word. Really get your minor hat on, and get that ax pick, and get ready to get dirty, you know? And that's all, I mean, that's why I, I love how God ordained for my life to have the abuse and the exploitation and the violence as a kid growing up. I don't like it, but I'm thankful for it because within that package of, of suck, I had lawn maintenance mixed into that. And I don't know what it is, but I told you before about this. When I go walk around the neighborhood, I, there's not all lawn maintenance smells, but there's a certain smell. I haven't smelled it in a while except for that one time a couple weeks ago. And I was like, oh, it just it, it brings up not a bad, but a good feeling. I don't know what it is, but it just reminds me of of just the that that blue collar work to you drop until you're exhausted kind of day that my dad put us through when the sun came up your butt was out of bed and then you didn't get it back home till the sun was down you were dirty and filthy and smelly and sweaty and you got paid a buckus zero for your whole day at work because he said do you do you, you uh get a shelter do you get food do you get your clothes well the money belongs to me okay that's what he would say to us i'm like okay fine then he also would hit us too, but that's fine. But the reality is we were just like, you know, I mean, stinky, smelly, sweaty, tired, exhausted. But it just reminded me, it, I don't, at the time I didn't like it. I hated it, to be honest. But looking back, I kind of like it. I, I really do. And Because in this day, babes will tell you, my wife and my bride of 30 years, I can tell you, there's, I go out and walk the, walk the yard every single week. I walk, I walk the yard. I pick up loose branches and different things, just a little thing. I, I, don't, I, I love being out there. And so it's, it's because of what was ingrained in me as a kid. So my point is that there's certain things that, that you, if you don't work for them, you're not going to understand the benefits of the work. And that's because of the result that it gives you. The process itself leaves its mark on you. The process of working itself leaves its mark on you. And when it does, that's what God intended when he told the man to till the garden. Before there was sin, so for those liars who say, work is a sinful consequence. Liar, God told the man to work the garden before there was sin. So stop your lies. Those who think work is evil, it's not true at all. Work is good. It's a good thing. You know? So the whole sweat of the brow thing is the bad part. So the reality is that that work was good. And, and it just reminds me how Paul's saying, just remember, if those don't want to put in the work, that's their loss, not yours. You know? Someone used to say at, my, at, at, the, at the employment, they used to say, your lack of planning does not constitute my emergency. I go, what? And he goes, you know what I mean by that. Think about it, Preston. And I go, that's what you're saying is, because I didn't know what to do, and I didn't do it right, and when I come to you for the answer, for the solution, you're going to take your sweet time. That's what you're saying. <laughs> and he goes, you got it, because that's all on you. Because I told you what to do, you didn't, didn't listen to me, you ignored me, you did your own thing, and now you created a problem, and you want it fixed right away, that's on you. I'll get to it when I get to it. Right now I'm busy. Wow. Your emergency doesn't, your, your lack of planning doesn't constitute my emergency. I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay. Um, so, all right. So, I remember that, that this whole concept of what God's saying in this whole chapter 3 at the end where it goes from verse 10 all the way through verse uh, 15 about, hey, look, don't look down those people who are basically acting disorderly and not putting in the work, whether it's physical or spiritual. And I want to end with telling you, what are the three kinds of disorderly people? Don't forget, there's three kinds of what he calls disorderly or atakos. These are the same people mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 5.14, that same word he uses of them, and he says you have to admonish those kind of people. What does admonish mean? Admonish in the scriptural word means to instruct them through a reason. You actually have to, you have to admonish them by through instruction and reason with them. So you're actually you're, 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 you're making them come to a corrective conversation through a rational conversation of teaching them why that's wrong. 
So don't do the whole, because I said so thing. No. You got to tell them why. Explain to them why it's wrong. Explain to them how to do it right. Give them a reason as to why it should be done right. Give them a reason of why it's wrong. Reason with them. Admonish means to reason with, to, through instruction, right? So you're doing that with all these kind of people, and the three kinds of people, and, and this time together with, is number one, is the immature people that are in the mysteries. Those that are with scripture, we, we looked at our spiritual growth cycle chart. The mikros is the type of person who, who took the mysteries and hid it in the sand. Because they know, oh, you're a harsh master, and, and, and you, you, you pick up what you did not sow down, and I was afraid. Because you're afraid of God, you did nothing? Reason with that person and say, hey, you know what? Uh, the fear of God to do nothing, I could see how I could paralyze you. Do you really want to be in a situation like what Elihu told Job that one day or the next becomes your present to your future and now you're standing before him in judgment? Do you really want to have that be the last thing on your mind? That you were afraid of him? Of what you thought would be, how much more are you going to be afraid of him when you know who he is right in front of you as your judge? I think you should be getting going on with this process of uh, moving on in your faith, don't you think? You know, encourage them, instruct them, and reason with them. And then the people that are also in the, in the, sper in the sperma that are immature people, not just micros that hide it in the sand, they're the other ones that are plodding along slowly, the pation and technon. They're, they're words in the Bible for they're growing in their faith, but they're just growing slowly. They're kind of getting stuck in the mud, a little in the weeds, feeling bad about themselves. Encourage them to build, to grow up in the maturity, to encourage them to say, let me tell you something, there's, there's more joy and, and more knowledge and understanding about who God is. The more you know about who God is, believe me, think about this. Here's what I tell them. I say, hey, wait, wait, would you agree that the more you know, the more mature you're, you're going to, you, you, you have an opportunity to even mature more? Because the more you know, the more you can draw from to have application to become more mature. Is that fair enough? They go, well, yeah. Okay. Well, Jesus said, he that obeys me is he that loves me. And you have to have his commandments to keep them to obey him, he said. So the more you have knowledge of, the more, the more you have an opportunity to obey, which means you can love him even greater, right? And they go, yeah, but I already know a lot. No, no, but that's not the point. Wouldn't you want to love? Is there ever a stop limit on your willingness and desire to love God back after all he's done for you? Shouldn't you want to give your best? Shouldn't you want to give everything you've got? So learn more. So you can then obey, have a, chan have a chance to obey more, so you can have a chance to love even more. And they go, what? Yeah, so come on, come with me and you'll see an awesome book of Revelation. <laughs> so it's just inspiration all over the place. So help those folks. So take the immature people and help them, admonish them with, with getting them the sense of instruction, but then, and encourage them. But, the, but there's also foolish people that are disorderly those are, the, those are the foolish ones, are the ones that are mature, but they are presumptuously arrogant, and they feel like, I already have a level of introductory maturity, I have a framework of Dionea, what do I need to really do anything else? They're, a little, they're out of place. That's not becoming of the behavior of somebody who's been invited to a wedding feast, is it? But they have this attitude. So you gotta reason with them, but I would do that in a more corrective, stern way and saying, you, you do realize that you never stop growing, right? Think about that. Just the premise of what you know now versus what you didn't know years ago, wouldn't that now then say that you didn't know what you didn't know, right? So how is that not true now? How do you know what you don't know? And therefore, how could there not be more reasons and more opportunities to continue to learn and not get stationary and just say, I'm good? We know enough. We call ourselves kingdom people. No, come on. Continue to pursue. Continue to strive. And then lastly, of the disorderly people, there's, there's the disobedient ones. Those are the ones that are breathless and nephios. The ones that are, are the ones that had the seat fall by the wayside. Those are the ones that say, I don't want to have the enemy rule. I don't want my, I don't want my, my sovereign to rule over me. He's an enemy of mine. And that's why God and Jesus in the typology there in Luke 19 said, bring my enemies before me and slay them. Yikes. And what do you do with disorderly? He tells you in chapter 3 of Thessalonians. You don't treat them as an enemy, but you do ignore them. You don't let them get to you. Let them in quietness have their own desserts. He tells you that in the physical, but also the spiritual in verse 12. He said, now such we charge and exhort you. What kind of one? The ones that act busy but are doing nothing? Let them be 
Let them, let, them, let them posture and build false narratives. Let them go. Don't let them have rent space in your head. Don't give them that. Let them work in quietness. Let them eat their own bread. Let them reap what they sow. Let them lay their own bed. Let them make their own bed. Let them lie in it. They don't, they don't want to hear admonishment. Ignore them. Let them go. Like Emmanuel said, if they're not for us or against us, let them be. If not of God, it'll come to naught. So that's what I wanted to hear. That's what he ends with. He ends this, this two epistle writing to the people of Thessalonica that starts off with edification and, and, and understanding who they are is in the middle, at the end of the book of 1 Thessalonians, ends with prophecy, charges them at the very last chapter how to live their life and becoming more becoming of the behavior. Then the second epistle does the, just the reverse. He starts off with, well not reverse, he does the same thing, but he starts off with a really heavy hand on prophecy because he already built up to the whole stroking of their egos in the sense of helping them understand how much they mean to him and where they're at in their faith, their position in Christ, what's at stake. He's already gone through that, but now he gets through the meat and potatoes of, hey guys, remember what's out ahead. Remember your vindication is out ahead. Don't you let people dictate what matters more in your life. You control what you want to choose to think on. You control what it is that you desire to what you make important or not. Make God important. Make the values of what He's instilled in you, of what He's given you, what, what, what drives you, what motivates you. Let that consume your thoughts. Not what people say about you or think about you. Right? You know? And so then in chapter 2, he, he, he again in 2 Thessalonians reminds them, don't forget our assembly. That's what matters here, guys. All the other fanciful word art of, of, of this coming of Christ here or, or this supernatural event there or this prophecy happens over there. Don't let, it's good to, un, to be aware. It's always good to be aware. Always good. But don't let that distract you. Don't let that deter you off what you know to be true about what matters for us. And then lastly, he ends up with this whole thing about how to behave ourselves. You know, Remembering how God has a prize guarding of our minds away from the Paneros one. How much more should we, in the love of, the, of, of God, into the patience of the under-resilient resolve of Christ himself, how should we not behave amongst those like Christ, how did he behave when someone was being ugly to him? Did he lash out? Did he get demoralized and depressed? No. Let those be. He wanted, they, want to, they want to do evil? Let them be. Let them be. You know, remember that. Remember, the Pharisees and Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, was constantly brewing of ways to catch Jesus. There's <laughs> not one conversation Jesus ever had where he goes, Okay, guys, today we're going to the Sanhedrin. We're going to expose these yahoos. Never once did he do that. Never once did he go, today we're going to go to uh, Ananias and Caiaphas, and I'm going to make them look like fools. It's going to be a great day. There's going to be two platforms set up on this talk show of Christ versus moron, and we're going to have a great time. That's not what happened. He just ignored them. He ignored them for the most part. When they came to him, he interacted. When he was brought to them by force, end of his life, they interacted. But he'd never set out a time to have his up and comings of, of setting them straight. They were disorderly. He knew it. He admonished them, tried to teach them when, he, when, when, they, when they were around. They didn't want to hear it. Let them alone. They ignored him. Don't let people take up your time that aren't worthy of it, right? So I'll end with one thing I heard today, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, it's pretty cool and pretty apropos, which is what this is kind of segueing into. It was a statement that and I'm not going to take credit for it. Andy Stanley said this which I heard him today, and it was pretty awesome. He said that if, if, you have a, if, if, you, if your life has no means to an end, then it has no meaning. I said, wait, 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 say it again. He <laughs> says, if your life has no means to an end, then it has no meaning. Remember what Paul was telling Thessalonians. He was saying, look, guys, our end to our means is that all this persecution and affliction we're going through, the end is our invitation to have the best experience ever to be a part of the entrance into the heavens that looks unto the inheritance of the bride itself, obtaining that glory with Christ. He said, if your life has no means to an end that doesn't end with you, if it, if it ends with you, then it has no meaning. The meaning of your life needs to be an end that's about God. How's it, how does it end with Him? So the means to your end should be not, look at me. The means to your end should be, look at God. And so he said, if you have no means to your end that leads to God, then your life has no meaning. Because what you're saying is it's all about you. I'm like, whoa, that's pretty cool how he did that. <laughs> he said, 
if a means to an end ends with you, then your life has no meaning because it has to end with amplifying God, glorifying God. What are they going to say about you when you're not here? Oh, he or she was all about him or her? That's, that's, that's crazy. And that's what Paul's reminding the Thessalonians about. Just remember, there's more to this life than what people are putting you through. There's more than what you're going through. There's more than what you're feeling and thinking. Remember the spiritual is going to be the eternal reality you'll always have with you. This is a temporal place. Just remember that. Harder to do, I know, but it's just something you've got to be reminded of, and he's reminded of that. So that's what the two epistles were about at the end here. He ends with both epistles, a charging of them and encouraging of them to live the right way. So with that, we'll close in prayer. So Father, we thank you for this time again, opportunity today. Thank you for working through the technology. Thank you for bringing us together, giving us a chance to still have study. Be with us, bless us through the weekend, bring us back together safely. We pray and ask all this in Jesus, Yeshua's name. Amen. Thanks for coming tonight. It's probably a surprise to see you. Oh, I said I was going to come. Yeah, yeah.